Hey guys, Crypto Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about strain wave gear mounts or harmonic drive mounts, which are a newer type of mounts that have become mainstream recently. And they're very different from traditional mounts that we've been using that were driven by a worm gear type of system. Strain wave gear mounts, they rely on strain wave gear uh, drives, which are completely different. And the main advantage of those drives is that you can have like a tiny light mount like this one. This is the UMI 17 Lite, which I will soon review on the channel. So subscribe not to miss that review. But it's something like 3 point something kilograms, and yet it can carry a payload of 10 to 13 kilograms of scope on this without needing any kind of weight. It's completely crazy because you get something that is compact, that is light, that does not need counterweights, and yet that can carry a very large payload. Crazy, crazy stuff. And there are some drawbacks, like you absolutely need to be guiding with those mounts, or you need like uh, encoders included in the mount, like high precision encoders. Uh, otherwise, you'll get issues in your imaging. But with auto guiding, those mounts are absolutely incredible. And it first started a few years ago with brands like Hobeam or Rainbow Astro. And at the time, they cost like 4,000, 5,000 US dollars. And it gradually got cheaper with the ZWAM5, ZWAM3, uh, the Ioptron HAE and HEM types of mounts. And now we also have uh, things like Skywatcher with their Wave 100i and 150i, which is, are also strain wave gear mounts. And we have smaller providers that have some great mounts as well, like my own Warp Astron WD20, which is amazing. And the, uh, the UMI brand there with the UMI 17 Lite I have in my hand. Lots of offerings using this type of drives. And that is awesome. But with those types of drives come new types of specifications. Sometimes you look at the website and you're like, not sure what you're reading anymore because this is so new and so different from the previous types of mounts that we are used to. Now, before we go into the details, a little bit of background. What are mounts uh, if you're new to astrophy so I can you can understand what I'm talking about. So this is an equatorial mount. It is a strain wave gear mount, also known as harmonic drive mount. By the way, harmonic drive is the name of the brand. Strain wave gear is the generic term for the types of drives that we're talking about. So it's technically the more correct term. Okay, but we have this little mount there. Basically, what it will do is it has two axes. It has an axis in this direction here, so this axis here, and then another axis 90 degrees there. And the main axis, the called the right ascension axis, is uh, pointing to the celestial pole so that this axis is parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. What's happened is the mount has the scope mounted on it on top, and then it can use its motors to move the scope around, target a star or a galaxy or a nebula that we want to photograph or observe. And then it will use the RA axis there to counter the rotation of the Earth so we can track the object as it is moving across the sky from our point of view. And with a traditional worm gear type of mount, you have the scope at the top. And because the scope is so heavy, you need a counterweight at the bottom to well counter the weight of that scope at the top. So even if you have a small mount, and a relatively small scope, you still typically need a counterweight, which increases obviously the amount of stuff and the weight of the stuff that you need to bring with you to uh, image. Strain wave gear mounts, they don't need counterweights in a lot of the case. This takes 10 to 13 kilograms of scope without any counterweight. Okay, but what about the specifications? So for that, we're gonna look at for now, the ZWAM3 mount, which is their small strain wave gear mount offering. And uh, we'll have the weight of the mount, just like usual, 3.9 kilograms, very light. And here we come to the interesting stuff, which is 8 kilogram to 13 kilograms payload. And you can see that 8 kilogram is without counterweight and 13 kilogram with the counterweight. This is obviously something different than uh, our traditional mounts. We have a payload capacity without counterweight, which is absolutely crazy. And you can see it is actually based on the assumption that you'll be having the center of gravity of your scope 20 centimeters away from the right ascension axis of rotation. So for this particular mount, it is this axis here. So the distance between this rotation axis and the center of gravity of the scope that is mounted on, on top is assumed to be 20 centimeters. 
but fear not, you can compute your payload at any distance from the axis of rotation very easily. So let's have a quick look. We're going to use this specification here which is basically telling us that the maximum output torque of the type of strain wave gear paired with the type of motor that they used is 16 newton meters. This is not 16 newton per meter, this is 16 newton meters. And to get from this to 8 kilograms, it's very simple. We take this, we open a calculator, and we take this 16 newton meter figure, and we divide it by the distance to the uh, rotation axis, which is for us 20 centimeters or in meters, 0.2 meters. We get a result of 80 newtons. And with the Earth's gravity, uh, this basically, we can just divide this by roughly 10, by 9.81 actually, but by 10 to get basically eight kilograms. And so that's where we're coming from. If you're using a larger scope, so your center of gravity is higher, further away from the right ascension axis, rotation axis, you can use this to compute what would be your actual payload. So overall, that's how this works in terms of this torque that is available. But let's go further down into the details. And specifically, we'll be looking here. You'll see that we'll have some very interesting stuff which is the uh, RA drive and the deflation drive. They have the type of stepper motor here. They both, both drives use a NEMA 35 stepper motor and they're paired each with a number 14 or type 14 strain wave gear. And you also see the mention of a brake, which is important. I'll get back to that also in a moment. But you can see the most important right here, this model number 14, you'll see it in a lot of mounts. You'll see 14, you'll see 17. So if I go, for instance, to the uh, UMI 17 Lite, which is the one that I've been, uh, I've been showing you here, you can see it uses in the right ascension axis a type 17 harmonic drive. And if I go to my own mount, my main mount that I use all the time, uh, it has a type 20 strain wave gear drive. And that type of drive will basically determine the maximum torque that can be done with the system. And we should be able to realize that torque if we pair it with the right motor. So you will see that very often type 14 drives will be paired with a NEMA 35 motor, sometimes 42 as well. Uh, type 17 drives will be paired with a type NEMA 42 stepper motor. And then type 20 drives, they might be, mine is actually paired with a servo motor, which is a completely different type of motor. I'll get to the difference as well in a moment. Okay, but you can see basically type 14 drives, we can expect 14 to 16 Newton meters of torque. And you saw how we can get from that 16 figure to the actual payload earlier. If we're talking about type 17, we could expect something like 28, 30 Newton meters of torque. And when we go to type 20, then we can go to things like, depending on uh, even like the, uh, the type of type 20 drive that we're using, something like 40 to 50 Newton meters. So it really increasing the payload. And all of that is without needing counterweights, because you can see going back to earlier with the counterweight, basically ZW is saying you can have a counterweight of up to five kilograms to add up to five kilograms to your payload. So this number here tells you the torque that's going to be available. And if it's paired with the right motor, like this NEMA 35 is just good enough, 42 would probably be better just to be safe. Uh, it's working well. Now, stepper motors. Let's talk about stepper motors. You have two types of motors used. Typically, you have stepper motors and you have servo motors. And I'm talking about brushless DC servo motors, not like the fake servo motors that are actually a stepper with an encoder. I'm not even going to talk about those. But stepper motors, they're basically a type of motor where uh, you can tell the motor to move one step or even one micro step. And you know exactly how many degrees this are fractions of a degree, this will move your uh, axis, your rotation axis by when it's paired with your drive. So because of that, 
you can blindly tell the motor to rotate a certain number of steps and you'll know without that having to check anything that your scope has rotated a certain number of degrees or fraction of a degree around that particular axis. So you can blind drive your scope. So that's super efficient. You don't need to have closed feedback loops within your system. You don't need things like encoders to figure out what's going, what's going on with your mount. You can uh, do everything blind using motor steps. The drawback of stepper motors is that uh, by using especially micro stepping, they sacrifice a lot of torque. And so to move those like type 14, type 17, even type, type 20 drives to the maximum of their capabilities, then you need gradually heavier and bigger motors. So the NEMA 35 is lighter and smaller than NEMA 42 uh, motors. And so, of course, that will impact the uh, weight of the mount, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a whole relationship between the type of drive and the motor that gives you the end result of this uh, 16 Newton meter of torque. Let's talk a little bit about the difference between the stepper motors that are currently used by most strain wave gear mounts that I've looked at and servo motors that are used by the uh, mount that I personally use, which is the WD-20. Before we do that, I want to remind you, you can help this video and the channel out super easily by simply liking this video, leaving a comment, letting us know your thoughts about strain wave gear mounts. Do you own one? Do you plan on buying one? What models are, your, are you considering? Anything else? you want to say or ask me leave it down in the comments always appreciate it and if you're new to the channel you can subscribe to the channel click that bell icon in which case by the way welcome and if you want to support the channel more directly at no cost to you and you're planning on buying anything like a strain wave gear mount from Agena or high point scientific or first light optic or even anything from amazon if you do so after clicking the links that i have in the description it actually helps the channel out at no cost to you. So it's super cool. And if you want to uh, help even more directly, you can join my Patreon as a paid member. Link is down in the description or join the channel as a member. I say it in every video and it's absolutely true. This channel would no longer exist without your support. I can't express how thankful I am for your support. So again, thank you so much. Anyway, back to motors. So I mentioned those stepper motors versus servo motors. If we go to the WD-20 uh, spec sheet, which I have here, you can see that we have the type 20 strain wave drive in RA. We have a type 17 strain wave drive in declination. Obviously for declination, because you have like a lot of the weight of the scope will be at the front and then a lot of it will be at the back as, uh, as well. The type of drive is much less important because the scope acts as its own counterweight naturally. But you can see the drive is direct drive by servo motor. And the motor is BLDC, brushless DC, servo and encoder. So what does this mean? In particular, the direct drive is something that's a bit mysterious to me uh, still, but I can only say that it works really well on this mount, whatever they did. What's more important is the motor. Basically what's happening here is they're using a servo motor. A servo motor does not know steps. So you cannot tell the motor to move like a certain number of steps and then you know the telescope has rotated by a certain number of degrees or fractions of a degree. You cannot do that. You can only tell the motor to move and stop, basically. The big advantage of that is that you have access to the full torque of the motor at super low speeds, as well as to the a certain maximum speed that the, the motor supports for that particular to torque. So you can react when you're guiding and you're tracking targets or you're slewing, you can react to changes super quickly, which is one of the main advantages, I think, of this uh, particular build. And I've heard actually that uh, Umi, the, the guys making this brand, they're releasing a mount with a servo motor as well. So it's good to see people like looking at innovation and then kind of boring that uh, innovation. It's good for us consumers. And the encoder that you see here, it's basically with a servo motor because we cannot tell the motor to move a certain amount. We just can tell it, you move, you stop moving at you know, a certain speed. You have an encoder that is necessary. So the encoder is just part of the feedback loop to the motor. The encoder is basically, uh, you can imagine it as a wheel with small slots in the wheel and you have a light sensor 
that will measure the number of slots that are rotating in it. And so based on that, you can figure out how much the telescope has actually rotated, stop the rotation anytime you like, etc. So that's what this encoder means. It is not one of those high precision encoders that you see in high end mounts. This is just for the closed loop system. So something to keep in mind when you're looking at this kind of specs. And if we look at the specs, you can see the familiar 15 Newton meters torque. So this kind of figure there. And it they tell you that it is 22 kilograms without counterweight at a distance from the rotation axis of 24 centimeters. So we can verify that, right? So I can open up my calculator again, take 15 Newton meters divided by 0 0.24 for 24 uh, centimeters. And then we divide that by uh, 9.81, which is the uh, acceler acceleration of gravity on Earth to get 21.2 kilograms, not quite 22, but warp astron have a much more detailed curve to look at. And, and here is the actual curve where you have like the distance from the RA axis compared to the load. Uh, and so you can get all of the details. I like to have this kind of level of detail in the specifications. And one of the things you'll see as well, again, we saw this with the AM3 and we see that with the warp astron again, is the type of the break the RA axis has an auto break. What does that mean? Well, actually, one of the other drawbacks are like differences between tra strain wave gear mounts and traditional mounts is that if they lose power and they're off balance, so let's say you have uh, your scope is completely on the side of the mount and so it exerts torque on the mount. Normally the mount is powered and so it counters that torque and, and moves the scope as it wishes. But if it loses power, that telescope will slowly boom, like go all the way down until it meets an obstacle. Usually it's slow enough that it's not a big problem. But if you have a break like this auto break that we see for the AM3 for the WD20, then even without power, the RA axis will avoid that. Most of mounts that do have a break in the RA axis do not have one in deck because again, deck is much more balanced by default than right ascension. By the way, if I look at some other mounts like the Ioptron HAE29, I, I, I can never tire of seeing this video by the way. But anyway, if I go to technical specs, uh, we don't see anything about the type of strain wave gears that they use are the types of motor that they use besides the fact that it is a stepper motor. So that's a bit frustrating. I wish there was more details. And it's the same if I look at the Skywatcher webpage uh, and I look at like the specifications, there's nothing. We just know that the payload is 33 pound for this 150i. Fortunately, if you search around, you can find screenshots like that from marketing materials where you can see that this particular mount does have a stepper motor, which one is unclear, but it is paired with a type 17 drive in uh, right ascension and uh, a type 14 drive in declination. So type 17 drive, we can expect something like 30 Newton meters, which if we divide that by 0 0.2, and divide by 10 further, it's roughly 15 kilograms of payload. So it matches exactly this. Now the design of the mount is also important. You can see with the 150i here, but also with this 17 light, a free way of supporting more payload without counterweight is to have the rotation axis as close as possible to the telescope because you consume much less of those 20 centimeters of distance that you should have between the axis of rotation and the center of gravity of your telescope. And then you get to the convenience features like through the mount cabling or you know the way that you can adjust the polar alignment, whether you can use it in out as mode, how you switch between equatorial mode and out as mode because some mounts are easier than others, etc. But that's the type of stuff that you are used to with traditional mounts. So what are your thoughts on this? Am I missing out on some specs that you would like explained? I don't know everything. I'm not an expert and I hope I didn't say too much BS in this video. By the way, if you're watching the video and you're wondering whether I said any BS, I'm sure other people will be putting more details down in the description, in the comments, sorry. So you may want to check the comments and leave your own comment while you're at it. While you're going there, like the video, subscribe to the channel and you know, use my affiliate links if you're gonna buy anything. 
I'll have links to the various mounts that I talked about in the description if you're interested. But obviously, much more important than all of that. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars. And I'll see you next time.